what, what I think is really interesting in Girard that, that people miss is that the problem with uh, modernity is we think leaving of the group is a sure mark of authenticity. And in some sense, the modern need or urge to be unique is just as socially de determined as the most outrageous forms of a conformity. All right, what's up, everybody? This is Other Life. I am Justin Murphy. I just wanted to let you know that I write a free newsletter to thousands of people every week. It's where I publish my best work, I share events that you can come to, and much more. We have an insane private community around the newsletter, and it's free. Go check it out. Just go to otherlife.co. That's otherlife.co. When you subscribe, I'm going to send you a folder of PDFs that contain all of my personal highlights from a bunch of my favorite books that I've read over the years. So you'll get a million insights after just a few minutes of browsing these PDFs, really. They're really special to me, and I just figured I'd share them with you all. So that's otherlife.co, otherlife.co. All right, Jonathan. So a lot of the listeners in my audience probably know a fair bit about Gerard. I've done a few podcasts in, in the past about Gerard. I've had people like Jeffrey Schellenberger on, and it's Gerard has been a topic of conversation on my podcast cool. and in my community for quite some time. So I thought the most interesting and fun way to start would be to ask you, what do you see as the most interesting dimension of Gerard that you think most people don't fully appreciate yet? Yeah, well, uh, one, one way to take a cut at the question is to, to see, to, 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 to ask what are the big misconceptions of Gerard out there? And I think the biggest misconception is that um, desire is only driven by mimesis. Uh, that, that all we have to, to lean on is uh, sort of the opinions of others and uh, sort of the pull of models to form our desires. But um, my reading of Gerard is that that's not true at all. In fact, Gerard himself identifies two species of mimetic desire. One is called physical desire, and that's a desire to experience. And the other metaphysical desire is what people really think about when they say mimetic desire, and that's the desire to be. Um, now, Gerard, uh, the reason people mistake this is he's not a very careful thinker. He's more of a, almost like a prophet, um, but, but not a sort of structured analytical philosopher. Um, and, and the way to sort of give your readers an understanding is that, uh, take the example of, of sex. Uh, if you pursue it for the experience of it, whether it's uh, physical intimacy, whether it's pleasure, um, then that's the uh, physical desire, the desire to experience. And if you uh, pursue it because of having sex with a certain person says something about you, then that's the desire to be. And so in this light, Gerard is actually a lot more charitable and plausible in his response of what are human dr desires driven off of. That indeed, there is a strong component of metaphysical overlay that we are being mimetically influenced by people we both want to be like and want to be distant from, pursuing the objects of the former and disavowing the objects of the latter, but there is a core, if not authentic desire, than a desire actually directed at the object itself. Other than the example of sex, what is the upshot of this distinction? What are some examples that people might be able to relate to in their own life? I think it really exists across the board. And what's crazy about uh, Gerard's model of human nature is that um, desire is really malleable. And the, the same sort of activity, you might be motivated by physical desire and I might be motivated by metaphysical desire. Let me give you a few more examples. Um, one could be career choice, right? And you see this a lot with elite school kids. Um, you know, is, is being an investment banker for the first two years and doing spreadsheets really that enjoyable? Probably no one does it for physical desire, right? But it's all a desire to be because you want to be the big shot Wall Street banker. Um, another one is, you know, in our purchase of cars or houses. Um, some people purchase cars for the mere utility because it saves them the, the sort of discomfort of having to walk everywhere. And some people purchase cars because of what that car says about them. Another example, and you can see how this can multiply uh, throughout your entire life, is uh, the philosophies we really choose to read, right? I got into Gerard, actually, out of a desire to be, because Peter Thiel got into it, and I wanted to be like Peter. He was one of our big heroes. And uh, it, it was really understanding Gerard and, and, and having the joy of understanding him that the metaphysical desire more and more gave way to the physical desire. And so maybe one trite way of drawing a very simplistic, simplistic distinction is that while not all physical desire is uh, wholesome or pure, almost all of metaphysical desire is, is unwholesome and will, will lead you astray. And so this is a, really a faculty that spans your, your entire life. And I think it's a very uh, practical question that we should all be asking ourselves. Why do I really want to do this thing? Is it for the thing in and of itself? Or is it because of some 
broader social reason. Another aspect, and maybe this is to answer your first question as well, that I think a lot of people mistake about mimesis is that they think mimesis can only draw you closer to people. And indeed, that is the dominant logic that we see in Girard, right? We want to be, we want to pursue the objects of the people who we consider to have a greater degree of being, whether these are celebrities, whether these are entrepreneurs, whether these are a slightly more successful coworker. But you just need to take that logic and flip it on its head to get to what Gerard calls the negative phase of mimesis. And the logic of this phase is to disavow objects um, that, uh, for people that we think have a deficiency in being, right? I mean, and, and the, the, the schoolyard example here is we both want to wear the sneakers that the, that the cool kids are wearing, and we, we both never want to wear the brands that the sort of outcasts are, are, are wearing. Um, and the reason that this is interesting um, is because the problem with uh, modernity is we think that uh, every form of leaving of the group is a sure mark of authenticity, right? There's a, uh, uh, a movie, I believe, in the 1940s called The Wild Ones, and Marlon Brando is starring in it, and he's dressed up as this bicycle gang leader, like very cool guy, and he, he's in this bar, and uh, they're like, uh, the girl goes up to him, and, and, and she says, what are you rebelling against? And he says, well, what do you got? <laughs> the implication that they're being, he, he doesn't really stand for anything, right? He's just out there to rebel against whatever you put in front of them. And in some sense, this form of modern rejection of the group, the modern uh, need or urge to be unique, is uh, just as socially de determined as the most outrageous forms of uh, conformity. And so uh, maybe that's another answer to, to your first question, of, of what, what I think is really interesting in Gerard that, that people miss, is that Mimesis really pulls it both, both ways. I think it's one of the most striking ironies of how Gerard is perceived in contemporary culture, that there's basically a lot of kind of mimetic Girardianism, right? It's like yeah. uh, Gerard, is pop Gerard is popular, Gerard is kind of hot right now. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, you know high status to signal your Girardian uh, bona fides. And so this is obviously profoundly ironic, but you're clearly self-aware about this. You, you alluded to it, to, to it yourself. If you find yourself genuinely drawn to something, but you also have the self-awareness that, okay, this is also kind of trendy. How should people think that through? How What resources does Gerard provide us for actually navigating that uh, authentically and thoughtfully? Yeah. So um, Gerard, to answer your question directly, does not provide us very much. You know, the joke that I make is, uh, Gerard is, is my Virgil, you know, Gerard is to me what Virgil is to Dante. Uh, and that's both a deep critique as well as deep praise. Because even though Gerard could outline the shape of human, uh, human misery and, and, and sin, inferno, and could guide me into purging their more milder forms, purgatorio, much like Virgil, who had to leave Dante in paradise, Gerard had very little positive prescriptions to offer. Um, and this is especially true when you get to his later work. Uh, his final book, Battling to the End, where the only solution that he gives is withdrawal, leaving the world behind. Uh, and he sees the ideal of withdrawal as embodied in the 19th century a poet and, and friend of Hegel's, Holder Lynn, who literally, uh, you know, pun intended, hold himself uh, up in a tower for, I think, the last like few decades of his life. And so Gerard, and this is why people who get into Gerard are very, very dissatisfied at, at, at the end usually, uh, actually has very, very little prescriptions for how to navigate a mimetic world. Um, but, but obviously I, I, I've spent the majority of my last, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, of my last few years thinking about this problem. So, so I, maybe I can take a stab at what I would say to, to, to people Please. who are interested in, in navigating this. Um, the first is the understanding of, of mimetic theory and, and awareness. And I, I've often been asked, um, you know, how does understanding mimetic theory uh, change you as a person? Does it rapidly just make you not mimetic? And the answer is no. Um, but what you do get is, you know, what, what a military strategist John Boyd said. Um, he said something like, great fighter pilots uh, use their superior judgment to make sure they never have to get into any situations where they have to use their superior fighting skill. And the same thing is, is true about rationally cognizing mimetic theory, that if it does not give you uh, the miraculous ability to stop being mimetic in the same type of environment, um, to sort of, uh, sort of uh, 
defeat pride as it arises in the moment, it does give you the foresight to sort of avoid bad situations altogether and, and be able to see where mimetic contagion might be uh, sort of more, more likely. So that's the first thing, understanding mimetic theory. Um, the second thing is, uh, as I mentioned with this sort of uh, my introduction to Gerard, where a lot of it was you know, metaphysical desire initially, and that, that, that sort of gave way to sort of physical desire. Um, I think that it's not unfair to interpret these two desires on any one of our pursuits as in some sense competing for real estate. That the more you have of one, that the less that the other sort of directs you. And so the simple answer is to find something that you really do love to do uh, in and for itself. And let me give you the converse case. There are some, some professions where you know, almost everyone is extremely prideful or, or, or like driven on fumes. Maybe this is like, you know, um, freshman year at an Ivy League or first two years in an investment bank. And the question is, well, why is that? Well, my answer and Gerard's answer would be, well, there's no physical desire to go off of. The actual activity you're doing is so boring that you're either going to lose motivation in doing it or you're going uh, you're, you're to have to be motivated by pride and, and sort of prestige. And so that's the, the second really big answer, is that you want, to, um, you want to find activities that you enjoy doing in and for itself. Now, the third uh, answer, I think, is that you want, to, you want to decrease your pride. You want to decrease how much you desire this fullness of being that, that is really driving metaphysical desire. And there, I think there's roughly two strategies. One is to really fail at something. This is not something that obviously one can aim for because then you wouldn't be failing at it. But I think people who are really ambitious and prideful, they, they naturally, you know, thankfully tend to fail at a lot of things. And so being uh, thrown at the rocks of failure, if you will, sort of really helps with you becoming disillusioned with it. And, but the opposite is also true, I think, is getting close to what you thought would grant you autonomy. And for me in my life, I think my life has just been a series of disillusionments. Whereas a naive kid, you know, if I get into an Ivy League, oh, then I will be happy forever. You get there and it's n n n nothing better. Oh, if I you know, dated a really, really attractive girl, you do it, you know, and then you get closer and closer. You know, if I, if I become a billionaire founder and then, you know, it, it, it's the same sort of logic, right? Um, so so the, 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 those are the first you know, three things. And maybe the fourth thing is for me to caution people to not try to be non-mimetic. Um, and in some sense, if you think that you can be non-mimetic, then you really truly haven't understand how deeply mimesis really extends. That what you, the goal is not to be this individual, this rational agent to be able to affirm one's own values. The goal is to construct the right type of social environment around you um, such that the, the relationships are you know, wholesome and pure and rather than mediated uh, by metaphysical desire. And so I guess what I'm trying to say there is, um, you know, very practically, uh, find people who affirm the thing that you like uh, and, 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 and through recognition uh, 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 sort of grant you that, that social need that if it's not fulfilled, you're going to go out and ch chasing it in a more perverse form. It, it, it makes sense that if mimetic tendencies are pervasive and ubiquitous in all people, no matter how you cut it, then the solution is not to try to be anti-mimetic or non-mimetic, but rather to construct your social environment thoughtfully such that to the degree that mimetic influences take hold, as they almost certainly will, what's getting mimetically replicated and, and incentivized is as wholesome and pure and independent as possible or something like that. that that's right. And I think that there's really two things here if you want to really dig, dig down. There's the content and the form. So on the, on the content side, you want the mimesis to be directed uh, to the thing that you that you want to do, right? If you don't want to be a doctor and you hang out with, you know, Harvard Med School people all, all day, th then I imagine you're going to have a quite a miserable existence because everything your social world, everything the Mises is going to tell you to do, is going to be contrary to what you really want to do. So that's the uh, form side. I'm sorry, that's the content side. But I think there's also something to be said on the form that, you know. Be, be wary of anyone with extreme ambition uh, or, or, or like ex who is like extremely envious that, that if they desire something, even if it's the right thing in a different degree, right? Th this is how Dante actually establishes an inferno, right? It's like liking the wrong thing, liking the right thing in, in the wrong degree. Um, I think that can cause like a really bad environment uh, as well. Where, and if I can give you an example, 
Um, one thing I noticed that's, that's very odd is, you know, kids in, in high school, they, uh, they usually love sports. And if they're really good at them, they, they really, really like the sport. It's mostly physical desire mediating, mediating them until they get to about like uh, 12th grade, where sports becomes important for admissions into elite colleges. Um, so, so it's even though the mimesis is like driving them to the thing they actually enjoy, if the, the form of that mimesis, and I'm not being very eloquent right now, but I think you have an intuition of what I'm trying to say, if that form of that mimesis is too extreme, if it's too prideful and ambitious, if it's too overpowering, um, you can actually turn something that, that you like into a chore. Right. And then ironically, you end up hating it and probably end up quitting, right? Like the people that are really talented in high school at a certain sport yeah. who get overly obsessed with the ambition and they get overly kind of oppressed by the need to win and, you know, become a professional or something like that, that can actually be self-destructive for certain people because the pressure of the ambition uh, becomes so oppressive that at a certain point they just hate doing it and they give up. Whereas if you can really just focus on loving the process, right. then you, that tends to be actually a more practically effective long-term uh, attitude for, for actually winning and, and, and succeeding in your ambition. Precisely. And, uh, you know, I know we want to talk about this at the very end, but if it may jump just a slightly bit ahead, but we don't have to go the whole way there. That's one of the reasons I decided not to do a philosophy PhD, uh, or right now at least. Um, and the one liner I always say is, I love contemplation too much to make out of it a career. And perhaps this is something you can relate very, very deeply to, given your sort of past life as an academic, where it's something you might love. Um, the reason philosophy was so interesting for me as an undergrad is because I, I pursued it freely, you know? Um, and I didn't have these expectations of needing to publish or like needing to, you know, satisfy or appease, th appease this person or that um, to get it, to eventually get a job. But I felt like if I became a PhD, if my entire identity and livelihood become, became dependent on that, then that would actually pervert the thing that I, I love the most into something that, that sort of becomes a chore. And now, again, the, the one thing I want to say is that doesn't mean go into the woods and read and, and, and be alone. Maybe that will work. But I think history has shown with people like Nietzsche that, that, that if, you're, uh, if people don't affirm you, if you're not recognized, you can kind of go crazy at the end of the day. Um, the, the way that it worked so well for me in undergrad is I had two very, very good friends who were also just in love with philosophy. <laughs> and, and, and we weren't envious or rivalrous with, with each other. And you know, we just affirmed each other's desires for philosophy. And, and this is the, uh, the ideal of the, uh, the contemplative life uh, in Rome and what Augustine was, was yearning for as well. So maybe there's something to that. Also, when I was a professor, the, the challenge I was constantly facing just psychologically was that a, a lot of the highly successful academics around me, when I looked at their lives and I looked at their careers, I didn't really feel memetically inspired. Like I didn't really want, I didn't feel the, I didn't feel drawn to yeah. it. Like I didn't feel energized to work hard to get what they had, it just didn't really motivate me to want to be like right. that. Not for any disrespect to them, not because their life was yeah. bad or anything like that. A lot of them were quite, a lot of them were quite happy. For me, I wasn't able to click into that, that positive kind of mimetic energy where I wanted to be like those people. I wanted to have what they had. I had gone so far in academia, I paid my dues and, and kind of climbed the ladder for so long. But once I got there, it was like, the people I actually was inspired by and actually did identify with and wanted to, to emulate or play in a game with and, and be as good as, all of those were like wild, independent internet people. Right. And that's that's basically, that was the context for me where I was like, you know, this academic game just isn't the game that resonates the most strongly with my most passionate, naturally zealous, creative energies. And I think it's an example of what you're talking about, about being able to identify what are the most productive social environments for right. you. Um, you do have to kind of situate yourself in a game where, and in a social environment where the mimetic tendencies are going to be aligned with what you yeah. really want to do with what, how you really want to express yourself and how you really want to work because the mimetic pressures are going to, they can, if engineered correctly, they can pull the best yeah. out of you. There's a, there's an interesting sort of, uh, you know, political insight that we can garner from this of why do, why is, uh, very broadly, why are good things allocated so unevenly in, in the world, right? Why is innovation coming from like one city out of, out of America or the majority of it? Why are for the, the best scholars in like three departments? And I think a lot of this is just mimesis, right? Like, um, do you have the, like, let's take this example. Um, probably the biggest benefit of going to an, an elite school is being surrounded by people who really like nerdy things. And in my case, that was, you know, reading the canon. And I had access to nothing more 
than what your like literally anyone with an internet had access to, except for fact the fact that I was in a social environment that strongly rewarded these like esoteric and really re really like uh, analytical takes on these really obscure books. But but that was like the key differentiating and motivating force. Um, and so uh, the, the sort of political insight we can draw from this is, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on where you stand, uh, I, I think greatness is always going to be very un unevenly distributed because of how important these mimetic forces are as a motivational force. And if you don't really get into those clicks, yeah, that's great. You, know, you, you just don't have the motivational force to, to, to do that. I'm very fascinated by the question of whether you can really truly understand and integrate Gerard's philosophy without being a Christian. I think we should talk a little bit about this, this link to Christianity, because of course, Gerard himself was an authentic Christian, especially towards the end of his life. You mentioned the book, Battling to the End. Uh, it's one of the most remarkable books of all of his books, in my opinion, because eschatology, his, his, his right. Christian apocalypticism, yeah, yeah, his Christian eschatology and apocalypticism really comes through like pretty remarkably. I, I think it's one of the most interesting and fun of, of the Gerard books to read. I would put it to you that I'm inclined to think that you, if, if you really like the ideas of Rene Girard and you think he, you know, really hits yeah. the nail on the head, then you almost have to become a Christian yeah. explicitly. Uh, do you agree? Do you disagree? Uh, do you I, I quite strongly that? disagree there. Um, as, as you know, I, I'm not a Christian. Uh, and as you know, I'm also, uh, you know, to put it lightly, quite interested in Gerard. Um, I, so I, so this, this is Gerard's sort of, we have a full, full lecture sort of on Gerard's sort of uh, defense, uh, apologi ap apologetic of, of Christianity. Um, that, that'll come out soon. But to give the very, very brief scope for people who aren't familiar, Gerard thinks that uh, the scapegoat mechanism, this sort of need for human societies in terms of chaos to find a single party to violently expel and gain peace from that catharsis, you know, think about the Nazis scapegoating the Jews, think about uh, the Black Plague being blamed on witchcraft, thinking about Thebes exiling Oedipus. Um, this is the process that forms human societies, but eventually actually creates sort of pagan gods or like all the gods essentially other than Christ. Um, and Gerard's claim is that, uh, you know, this a similar story happens with Christianity, but just from the opposite perspective, that Christ also becomes scapegoated, but instead of the story siding with the persecutors, as Gerard thinks all the, the, the sort of scapegoat stories are, are, are sort of told from, this side from the victims, right? Pontius Pilate, the, the person who sentenced Christ, doesn't believe he, he's guilty. Uh, it's written from the perspective of, of the disciples, and Christ is clearly innocent, right? That, that's like the key moral of the story. So to, to put it very, very loosely, um, Gerard thinks that Christ is the, the true God in, in some sense because uh, Christ exposed the escape, escape of the mechanism. Okay, that, that's a sort of argument. And I think I, I have like three sort of attacks on, on this argument. By the way, um, right now we're, we're sort of d debating the sort of truthfulness of Gerard's argument, but I do want to get to the point of whether one, can, like what part of Gerard's system remains after uh, we, we conclude he's not Christian. So these are two separate questions, but let me just give you an overview of the first one. Okay. Um, I, I have sort of three attacks on, on, on this argument. Um, the first attack is that there are other stories, even in the Western canon, um, that are sort of civilizational grounding stories of the victim shown to be innocent in Socrates and in Caesar, right? Socrates is innocent. That's what the, the apology is all about, what, what the Phaedro is all about. Um, and he, and he, if he founds literally the, the core, uh, uh, the father of philosophy. Um, and uh, on the Caesarian side, you know, he founds he found the Roman Imperium, like one of the most important sort of political entities that will influence all types of uh, institutional design to this very day. And, and of course, um, the Caesar, we're supposed to sign with Caesar, that he was uh, sort of murdered by these treacherous senators, right, led by Brutus and Cassius. Now, Gerard actually has a somewhat convincing uh, response to the Socrates uh, sort, of, sort, of, sort of rejection. I don't know if he has a good one to, to Caesar, but the mere fact that there are stories that are very, very similar and very, very important kind of, you know, uh, did, did, sort of weakens his position a little bit. And that's just in the West, right? So, so that's the, 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 my first problem with, with that argument. My second problem with the argument is that, um, and I'm not going to explain the, the reason why, but I, I, you know, I've been working on a, on a manuscript 
that, that tries to use Buddhist resources uh, to sort of rescue Gerard from himself, so to speak, to, to sort of complete Gerard, to, to give a final prescriptive solution of what, 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 what we do with mimesis. And in it, uh, I argue that um, the Buddhists identify the key phenomenological logic of scapegoating in the same way that Gerard identified the social logic. And so if you think that, uh, you know, the, the true religion is the one that gets close to the scapegoat mechanism, then Buddhism is, is at the very least like on par with Christianity to rising to that claim. Again, if you, if you buy my argument. Um, and the third one, and I think this is the most like devastating one, um, is why do we even have to give Gerard that premise? Why is the religion, the, the, the theory or, or thinker who exposes the scapegoat me mechanism, why are they divine? After all, sort of hu like regular brilliant humans come up with world historic insights all the time. What's so special about the scapegoat mechanism? And Gerard was actually pushed very, very hard on this. Why couldn't Jesus have just been a very wise man in a book called When These Things Begin? It's actually one of the most accessible, I think, Gerard interviews. And I strongly recommend your, your listeners to read it. And Gerard is kind of lost. He, 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 he fumbles a bit. He doesn't have a really good answer. And so, you know, before I actually answer your question, um, those, are, those are the reasons why sort of I'm not that convinced by, uh, by, by Gerard's sort of uh, defense of Christianity. But, but to be fair to Gerard, um, if you really sat him down and you, you really poked him, I, I, I really don't think, I, I really think he would say that no sort of logical argument is going to be sufficient to convert a, a non-believer. In fact, Gerard in his own life was sort of uh, converted to Christianity twice, one may say. One through reason, the weaker form, and the other after he, he, he had a brush with death when he recovered from cancer. What, what does Gerard's theory look like without Christianity? Right? That's, like the, that's like the central question we're trying to wrestle with. What is... Uh, what's left of the theory? Um, and I would wager, first of all, that it's very doable to pull uh, Christianity out of Gerard um, in a way that it's not very doable to pull Christianity out of Aquinas, for example, because like, you're just left with like nothing. But it probably is doable to somewhat pull Christianity out of Augustine. Um, and I think what Augustine and Gerard probably share is that they focus so heavily in explaining things with psychological mechanisms. Now, certainly psychological mechanisms that have a theological consequence, right? Gerard thinks metaphysical desire is literally original sin, and I, I, I get into that in lecture too, but psychological mechanisms nonetheless. Now, Gerard considers his theological project as what, what he calls an anthropology of the cross. And what he means by that is that he's able to translate a whole host of Christian phenomena into readily understandable anthropolog anthropological language, psychological, you know, social, fundamentally this-worldly human language. For example, uh, the Antichrist is hypocritical progressive movements. Satan is reactionary movements. Jesus' re revelation is not, about, uh, is not primarily about the salvation of your soul in another world, it's about how to achieve peace in this world. Gerard, dare I say, presents us with a very sort of atheistic Christianity because of how successful he is in doing this translation project. Does, does that make sense? Like he's so good at, 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 at sort of psycho psychologize, psychologizing Christianity, of explaining coarse Christian mechanisms into human anthropological psychological concepts that the other world is it sort of retreats into the distance. Like far are we from the angelic civil wars of Milton, far are we from sort of the, the, the immaculate descriptions of the afterlife of Dante, and far are we from the uh, sort of uh, inquiry into the trinity of, of, of Aquinas. Gerard barely brings up the next world at all, and he barely brings up the salvation of the soul. And because of this, because of how much he grounds Christ Christianity and, can, and how successful he is at explaining Christianity in this world, he sort of, it makes it very easy for it to be a Girardian without a Christian. One question I have is that, you know, there is a kind of interesting, almost materialist, uh, practical perspective that would say that Christianity has, has one possible claim to being uh, more than just a uh, lucky 
intellectual discovery from, you know, some guy named Jesus who just happened to figure out the scapegoat mechanism, which is that there does seem to be something unique and specific to the the Christian formation that grips people particularly well. It seems to generate a kind of uh, positive social cohesion that rapidly starts to spread around the world. And so, th you know, this would be a very non-theological, a very, a very, you know, practical empirical angle on it. But this is one possible angle to say this is something that clearly separates something like Socrates or Caesar from from Jesus, right? Because there's something about the the, the Jesus's message. There's something about uh, the Christian revelation that does seem to represent a unique and specific uh, threshold in in the history of Western civilization that that goes on and grows and and spirals outward for 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 centuries to a degree that you know um even even Rome you know really pales in comparison to so i'm not sure even how much i necessarily um, you know, buy into this this angle um, because you know, especially from a theological perspective, it, it's uh, it's to people who are more theologically uh, sophisticated. It, it, this is a kind of offensive line of inquiry, but I think there's something there, and I do find it interesting. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts. I, I, I think on that's that. quite quite a fair intuition, especially you know, compared to what Caesar did. You know, it was said I can't remember which historian said it, but he said that uh, Rome conquered the world thrice. Uh, the first through its armies, the second through its laws, and the third through its religion, Christianity. And one may add each more thoroughly than the next. So, so I think it's not unreasonable to think that Christianity's force on us uh, t -t today is, is much greater than uh, the, the Roman political system. Um, Socrates, on the other hand, it, you know, that, that perhaps that, 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 that's a harder you know, argument to make, you know, the, the fundamental grounding of philosophy and, and, and rational in inquiry and, and, and critique. Um, but, I, but I think the type of problem this sort of reasoning uh, uh, you know falls into you know fully acknowledge that this you, you're, not, you're not endorsing this but um, is uh, almost all world historic religions are like this right I mean Muslims um, commonly attribute the unlikely success of Muhammad est establishing his uh, sort of worldly reign and, and the quick dispersion of uh, Islam as another if not proof a sign of its true divinity. Uh, and Buddhists as well, they sort of point to uh, King Ashoka the Great, who, who, who sort of again is one of these like uh, Constantinian figures who, who sort of converted to Buddhism and made it popular. Um, and, and the sort of, I'm not endorsing this, but the, uh, the, the rationalist response to what you're saying is that a million of these religions pop up every sort of, you know, every, every century. Um, and as a result, you know, just due to the sheer force of large numbers and then the, uh, the, the force of the power law of mimesis, two or three of them are going to become world historic just out of random chance. Uh, and, 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 you know, so it's, it's actually not that surprising that, that there would be. So that, that's, that's, that's a type of argument that, that what you're positing is going to run into, like the problems of other world historic religions who have, you know, just as proliferated as miraculously. I mean, another question might be something like this. It would be that because the, it, it is in the nature of mimesis to escalate infinitely, it, it always, it always goes to, to the apex of things. Therefore, the only adequate solution to the problem of, of escalating mimetic conflict and violence would have to be something at the apex, it would, and it would, that means it would have to be something essentially religious. That that they're always for this problem to truly be solved, it can't just be some smart guy has some smart human idea that explains what's going on. Uh, it ha it almost intrinsically has to be otherworldly. It's almost it's it it almost has to have a otherworldly, almost supernatural kind of element to it, precisely because that would be the only vantage point from which this this constant pervasive infinitely escalating human anthropological problem always always escalates up to so so that would be that would be one one line of thought that would say the only solution to this almost has to come from on high in a way and and i think that's why you can see um uh, kind of the the, the jesus moment and the, the christian moment as a a kind of technically miraculous thing 
uh, it, it's almost technically miraculous that somehow it was revealed to us how this works. And we were given as a civilization this opportunity to exit that, that, that feedback loop of perpetual violence. Uh, it's almost a structurally miraculous or structurally otherworldly uh, type of thing, and that's what revelation is. That's what revel that's what it means for 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 a truth to be revealed rather than rationally exposed or rationally determined. And I think that's what Gerard, Gerard would probably want to say something like that. I I think your intuition is is fundamentally spot on there. In fact, um, I, I didn't go there before, but but I will now. Um, the explanation of Gerard's argument that I gave. Uh, was extremely simplistic, uh, r almost uh, criminally so. And I've, in fact, your intuition is actually much, much closer to Gerard's argument for why Christ is divine. Um, his argument actually goes something like this. Um, Christ is, uh, Christ shows the greatest form of innocence possible. Um, you know, virgin birth, you know, meek shall inherit, you know, love that neighbor. You know, he doesn't commit crimes in the Gospels. That I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, he's the most truthful person possible because he, he exposed, the, one of the ways, the reasons he was crucified was he, he was trying to expose the scapegoat mechanism or so Gerard thinks um, by, by sort of poking, fun, poking at the Jewish uh, legal authorities. And he's also the most loving person, right? What does he say when he's nailed on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Gerard's point is that not only is he the most innocent, loving, and truthful, like, but truthful, I mean, like, wise and, like, profound, like, an insight person, but he's also doing it in a moment where that is least hospitable, the least hospitable to innocence, truth, and love, right? Think about the love case. That's the easiest. It's easy for a Buddhist monk out there in the, in the, in the countries to say, I love all sentient beings. It's much harder um, to, to truly sort of profess, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do when you're being nailed to a cross and falsely accused. And so what you're getting at is precisely Gerard's argument here, that um, at the peak of the of mimetic escalation, the only type of entity that could be freed, as Jesus clearly was because of his innocence, truth, and love, um, of the mimetic me mechanism has to be transcendent, has to be a god, has to be. So, so your, your intuition is spot on here. Um, yeah, I, and I, I guess my, my response would be, you know, the, the Buddha also did some crazy stuff. That, you know, Muhammad also had, uh, you know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think this is going to be decided on, on, on reason. I don't think Gerard intended it to, to, to decide it on reason either. Maybe my, just my final comment or question, which is only somewhat related in battling to the end. He says that Christianity is the only religion that has foreseen its own failure. This prescience, this prescience is known as the apocalypse. And so to me, this is probably the, the, the final interesting uh, sub-thread on, on this topic at the moment, which is to say something like the following. It's that all religions or human organizational solutions to the problem of mimesis, like you could have a philosopher who just kind of shows how this stuff works, and then we could try to build organizations or religions that, you know, kind of... Uh, embody and integrate this anthropological knowledge that Gerard has without, you know, necessarily submitting to the to the recognition of of the Christian re revelation as as legitimate. But I think what Gerard is trying to say that's that's well reflected in this quote is that everything else other than Christianity is doomed to re to adequately uh, channel and harness these anth anthropological insights because only Christianity is is able to adequately um, kind of prefigure its own intrinsically doomed nature in other in other words so so if you try to do this through the lens of buddhism or you try to do this through the lens of some kind of secular religion which a lot of people actually nowadays are quite interested in the problem that you're always going to see i think according to this insight from gerard is that um it's always going to have this kind of um positive aspirational um, uh, pretense to to success um, because that's the only thing that people sign on to, right? A, a kind of something that considers itself doomed to, doomed to failure just doesn't really pass muster in 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 the modern world as thinking rational beings. But Christianity is this kind of very unique and specific um, kind of social, intellectual, spiritual um, system um, that allows its adherents 
to understand from first principles as part of its core beliefs that it is doomed to fail in the earthly city on the realm of earthly politics it, it we understand from first principles it is doomed to fail and this prescience known as the apocalypse is an intrinsic part of the core beliefs it's hard for me to understand how you can replicate that structure on on uh, non-Christian grounds, but maybe maybe you see how to do it in a way that I don't. Even if it were a unique feature, what, what does that say about Christianity to, to, to you, that, that, that it sort of foresees its own failure? Well, right. To, to me, this is crucial in the prevention of um, continued escalating mimetic conflicts around the supposed you know, solution to the scapegoating problem, right? Because you could say, you know, I could say, hey, everyone, I've figured out how scapegoating works. I have this anthropological model, which I've got from Gerard, and here's how it works. We understand these problems without any, you know, talk of Christian revelation. Here's the model. We understand how society goes wrong. So let's build organizations and projects and, and lives that, that avoid that. Well, the problem there is that once you start imagining that you have this model that allows you to live and flourish successfully um, away from the mimetic conflicts and, and escalating violence, then you, what you're going to see is you're going to start seeing people engage in uh, mimetic conflicts and essentially violence to you know, race after each other in the pursuit of that superior alternative form of life based on this anthropology. So only with, so the case would, would go like this, that because Christianity kind of sees the intrinsically doomed nature of right. the Christian project and, and prefigures that in advance as a core part of its philosophy, that is part of the, the logic that prevents Christian communities from spiraling into mimetic conflict around their anti-mimetic right. awareness. So that would that, that's one way to that's, put the, yeah, the that's argument. That's really possibly. interesting. I haven't given it that much thought, but maybe I can say some things tangential that, that are interesting. And then eventually, I, I still want I still need to answer your question about what does Gerard's philosophy look like without Christianity? I, I've only t we've only done the uh, prolegomena, if you will. Um, the one thing is, I'll say is, uh, you know, Gerard is a very unorthodox Christian in many ways. I, mean, you know, I think there's like four or five ways to list them out in lecture five, and we'll go into them because it's going to take us off topic. Um, and this, but this is one of them, that the certainty that Gerard thinks that Christian, Christianity has of its own failure, that, to my understanding, is, and you tell me if I'm wrong, is not an orthodox Christian position. For example, that famous line, I think it was Matthew 10.34, uh, think not that I've come to bring peace, I've I come not to bring peace, but a sword. Gerard takes it to say, to, 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 to say that Christianity is literally cutting down the pillars of worldly foundation, which are satanic in nature. Um, and that it'll bring about not just apocalypse, but like violent apocalypse. Christianity will bring that about almost necessarily. And in Gerard's final book, as you know, Battling to the End, the sort of necessity of a violent apocalypse is, is very certain. Um, but, but in my mind, that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that's not an orthodox Christian position at all. I think the orthodox Christian position is that there's some historical agency uh, and, and, you know, we have the chance of the kingdom of God establishing on earth or, 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 or we have, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or we're going to blow ourselves up. Um, so that, that's the first thing I'll say. Um, second thing I'll say is uh, I, I think that other philosophies, maybe we'll have to, you know, we're squinting really hard here just to see this, do have this sort of understanding of their own demise. Um, one is actually Plato. Uh, you know, one thing that always surprised me about Plato's Republic is that uh, the Republic is, so, is, is going to end, right? So, so if you are a philosopher king, if you're asked to rule the Republic, maybe it's not in your generation that it ends. Uh, I'm sorry, the Calypolis, maybe it's not in your generation that it ends, but it will end someday. Why? Because Plato gives us the degeneration of states, right? Aristocracy degenerates into... Uh, a timocracy, which degenerates into oligopoly, which degenerates finally into the worst form that Plato conceived, democracy. And so there is already a conception that even the best form of something is eventually going to degenerate. Um, but in terms of you know, religious examples, I don't know about this too much, but I think the Mayans also had an intuition of their own demise and, 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 and the world. And certain Buddhist sects, at least, um, also have a self-conception that at the very least, the current era of Buddhism is going to go to end. Uh, and they think that when all of the Dharma, when all the Buddhist teachings leaves this current world, that's when the next Buddha, 
uh, wh whom they call Maitreya, is going is, is to come again. So, so I actually think that uh, this intuition um, that the thing that you think is the best uh, will eventually de demise, uh, per that, that's probably not a common modern, certainly not a modern political intuition, but I think one can find, you know, many forms of it in, 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 in antiquity. Um, if, if I may, just to go back to your original question, because I think I've let us down a, let us down a unfortunate or maybe fortunate rabbit hole. Um, what is there left of Gerard? If you, like me, you don't subscribe to Christianity. Um, the, the very brief way that I will say this is that his psychological and social anthropological insights remain intact. His uh, historical analysis of pagan society remains intact. What changes is the po possibility of historical action. So to put it very simply, uh, Gerard had a very clear deterministic, almost end of history conception of the linearity of history. But without Christianity, that is no longer, uh, you know, that, that, that is no longer necessarily the case. Now, let me tackle the first part of my claim first. Uh, you know, and I think it's quite easy to understand, right? The reason I think so many, you know, atheistic Silicon Valley bros are, are finding it so readily, easily to, to adopt Gerard's uh, analysis of, of mimesis and even the scapegoat mechanism is that it's not really grounded on uh, an, an argument from God in the same way that Descartes' meditations were. Right? And, and it's very, they're, they're almost like empirical or perhaps hermeneutical sort of arguments. Like, let me show you uh, how insightful this type of seeing, this way of seeing human nature is by just going through these different examples. So all those psychological insights that I think people really go to Gerard for are still intact. Um, his understanding of, again, pagan society is pretty much intact because, you know, Christianity doesn't really come, uh, come into play. Um, now, what really changes here? I think is, is two things. One is, you know, I'm tempted to say that a Gerardian who isn't a Christian tends to be a reactionary or, or you know, unless they have other commitments like, like, like Buddhism. And the reason is because um, uh, the scapegoat mechanism for Gerard, right, again, this idea of, you know, sort of killing one to save the entire community, uh, using catharsis to, to establish peace, using violence and deceit to, to, to build the foundations of worldly order, is deeply ambivalent for Gerard, right? In some sense, it's a deep good. All we have to do is expel Oedipus and Thebes will be freed from the plague. Um, however, what allows, but obviously it's bad because it's violent and deceitful. Um, what allows Gerard to sort of tie break this, I think is his ultimate Christian commitments. That even if killing one person saves the community, that is, we, we should not do that because that is a, a bad thing to do in and of itself on Christian grounds. But without those Christian commitments, suddenly the utilitarian calculus of the scapegoat mechanism seems somewhat reasonable. And the same goes for, uh, for the, the prohibitions that stem from the scapegoat mechanism, right? So, so you know, w one of the ways that pagan societies prevented mimesis from uh, escalating is to establish prohibitions among people, whether these are gender roles, whether these are caste systems, whether these are guild lineages, however oppressive they brought peace to society because they clearly separated, you do this, you do that, desires will not cross. Again, Gerard's ultimate Christian uh, commitments enable him to say, no, one ought not do this for, the, for nothing but the simple fact that it is wrong, it is ultimately wrong. But once one is no longer a Christian, again, that, that utilitarian calculus seems quite attractive. Now, the second thing that I think really changes when, when you're not a Christian for Gerard is the scope of uh, historical agency happens, it, it expands. In Gerard's understanding of history, it's a series of scapegoat mechanisms, right? First, maybe there were the Egyptian gods, and then there were the Greek gods, and or, or the or Norse gods, and then the Greek gods, and there's a series of cyclical events of different sort of religious paradigm shifts. And in Christianity, set this trajectory, tra tra uh, set the trajectory of history into this linear sort of uh, apocalyptic scope. But if you don't think Christianity is actually that different from the religions of old, then Christianity becomes another cycle, a cycle that we can break from and that eventually we will break from. That one day, much like Zoroastrianism, for, Zoroastrianism, for example, uh, they will be no more. And what this does is that it gives us more historical agency. It allows us, again, reactionary movements, which Gerard thought were impossible, not only bad, but impossible, it allows for us to continue pushing on in our progressive direction. 
And importantly, it allows us the resources to, to sort of thwart apocalypse. So, you know, to, to put it very succinctly, or <laughs> much more succinctly than I have, um, when, when one is not, no longer a Christian in, in, in reading Gerard, um, what fundamentally changes is the broad scope and desirability of different forms of uh, uh, political activity in history. I want to move the conversation a little bit to what you're doing. You're an independent scholar yourself, and you have just released a lecture series about Gerard. And the way that you organized it and produced it uh, with our mutual friend, David Prell, is very interesting. Tell us about the idea behind it. What were you trying to do with this? How did the idea come about? And give us some background there. Maybe I'll start from, from, from the beginning. So I was, uh, you know, when I graduated college, I studied uh, CS and then I philosophy. Um, and when I was graduating college, I, I was like very torn between three different paths. One was a philosophy PhD. One was uh, building, building a startup, which I've been dreaming of doing since, since a kid. Uh, and the last was becoming a, a Buddhist monk, actually. Um, and the, the reason I chose this path that I'm on, so I'm, I've been building a company, uh, or I'm on the founding team of a company, uh, this fintech company founded by Joe Lonsdale. Uh, we're currently still in, still in stealth. Uh, and I've been building that for the past two years and basically working 24 seven there. So I actually haven't been able to make that much time for scholarship. Um, but the reason I chose that path was primarily because I think this is gonna be sort of the, the next multi-billion dollar financial institution. Um, but also because I felt like it was a better path, even if it were, what I was optimizing for was uh, intellectual life. Um, and, and I think this is where your, your more intellectually inclined uh, independent scholar listeners might be interested. Um, I've mentioned this before, but when I was looking at the lives of philosophy PhDs, I found it quite unenviable um, because all the freedom that I had to interact with different thinkers, Gerard being probably the, the key among them in undergrad, was no longer there, I think, in, in the PhD. And maybe it was there in the PhD, but certainly when you become a, philo a professor, and you're trying to go for tenure, as you can probably <laughs> tell our audience much better than I, um, a, a lot of that freedom to engage with what fundamentally drives you is, is sort of no longer there. Or to put it in a, in a way that we've already framed in, the sort of mimetic environment can turn a physical desire into a, a metaphysical desire. And actually, I, I don't know if you, if you know this, sorry for taking us down a tangent, um, I, I don't know if you've read Zena Hitt's book, um, it's called Lost in Thought. I haven't, but someone someone was talking to me about it recently. You, you must read it. I, 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 I when I was reading it, I felt so so recognized and affirmed by that book because it tells the story of Azina Hitz, who who is a uh, uh, professor. Hitz was uh, you know very tracked academic, I think, in McGill University, and she she talked about this exact mechanism where she went into philosophy for its own sake, and then soon it began. Um, you know, how can I get the, the coolest job? You know, how can be, I, I be liked by my colleagues? How can I get cool trips to, to Europe? Um, and I, I don't think this plagues all of the, the academy, of course. Um, but for me, I know that I'm, you know, probably much more arrogant and prideful and mimetic than the average person. That, that it would really, really get to me. And so another way of reading w what I'm doing now with the company is setting up myself uh, financially, but also importantly, socially and rec rec recognitively uh, to, to have another identity so that if and when I do go back into the academy, which I, I still want to do, I think a PhD in philosophy is a very, very great and something I, I would love to do down the road. Um, I, I, I have the, both the financial resources, but also more, perhaps even more importantly, the social resources, the recognition from society, friends such as yourself, um, to make me not caught up in that loop. And, and so, so that, that was like my overarching life decision path. And, but the primary thing obviously is, is I think the company is gonna be the next you know, billion dollar financial institution. Um, uh, you know, in terms of how this lecture came to be, uh, you know, one of the nice things about not having to worry about one's academic career is that you can really just pursue anything that you're fascinated with. And that's exactly what I did. And that's why I was so freeing in my three years of undergrad studying philosophy. Um, now, I, I think it's a terrible advice to give anyone who wants a job to study Girard because he's not taken seriously at all. Uh, in the academy, maybe in literary criticism, but certainly not in philosophy, certainly not, not, not in anthropology. Um, and if I had the, the goal of becoming an academic, I would have never had the freedom to engage with Gerard as deeply as I did. 
And I engaged with Gerard, not even out of theoretical curiosity, and after that sort of high of wanting to be Peter sort of uh, dissipated, it was because I thought that he was really getting at something, something deep. And so I basically spent three, you know, three, four, five years of my life reading um, anything by Gerard that I could get, get, my, get my hands on. And, and at the same time, I, I had quite a deep uh, uh, or, or quite a passionate engagement with Buddhism as well. I went to a Tibetan monastery in Nepal to practice. And I really wanted to square these two ways of thinking. Um, and so I embarked on my own sort of like, uh, you know, book manuscript process, about 50,000 words. I don't have time to work on it. So I published the unfinished draft uh, on my website. Of course, people are f free to read that. Um, and also in that process, I created this lecture series. So this entire lecture series, it was written out word for word um, and about 50,000 words. So it was, like, it was like a book project in and of itself. Um, and I was about to film it right when I graduated, but then COVID hit. Um, however, as you know, our mutual friend, David Perel, he got a grant from Tyler Cowen. Uh, he, he sort of said, Jonathan, you know, I'll do all the pre-production work, post-production work. You can dedicate your full time on the startup. You don't have to worry about anything other than giving these lectures. And so that's what we did. We rented out, uh, you know, a pretty nice hotel in Austin, uh, and we filmed it in three days. And those were probably some of the most stressful three days I've ever had to, ever been through. It was like lecturing for about like 10 hours a day because of the different cuts. Um, and, uh, you know, David's handling all the posts and he'll be handling a lot of the marketing as well. And so for me, it was, it was a great deal, all paid for. All I have to do is, is, to, is to give the lectures and, and David's handling all of that. And maybe for, for something that your, your, your uh, audience will be interested in, you know, I've often struggled, and this is a topic that Dave and I talk about a, a, a lot as well, is, you know, how do I write the type of engaging work that I do, uh, that, that I want to write, reaching an audience and getting that sort of mimetic affirmation that, that we've been discussing without compromising my work? Because, and I, I'd like to hear your response here, uh, um, I think writing in the public sphere is also quite dangerous as well, right? That there's always the pull towards the trivial, towards the catchy, towards culture wars. Um, and, and I think it's perhaps just as, if not perverted as, as the academy, then there's opposite forces that, that, that pull you in another perverted way. Uh, and, and my solution to that was, I, I think I'm gonna write uh, the same type of like dense analytical writing that I, that I think very little people are, 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 are gonna wanna read. So um, the manuscript, Completing Gerard, no one's read it and I knew sort of no one would, <laughs> would read it. I just wrote it for myself. Um, but I think uh, the video medium and the lecture medium is, really, is where you can uh, have like very sophisticated ideas, but sort of reach a really broad audience as well. And so that's my sort of solution, or we'll, we'll see how well it works, to this sort of tension between wanting to write the type of nuanced, sophisticated type of uh, intellectual work that I want to do, but also wanting to reach a, a broader audience than, you know, a, a circle of Gerard scholars. Yeah, that's a, it's a fascinating approach. I don't know of many people doing this method. So that's why I find it kind of interesting. Like the, basically to summarize your approach, as I understand it, you know, it's like go and get some money from someone who is willing to give a grant or invest in a project and use a significant amount of money to create some flagship, highly well-produced, really, really polished, sophisticated uh, video series, let's say, and, and create this kind of high effort, high investment, singular content product out on the internet that you you make a big bet on, you put a ton of effort into making it amazing and really hoping that it, it catches fire and really makes an impression and and is talked about and appreciated and studied um, you know for, for for years to come. It's a fascinating approach and and I'm watching with great interest to see how things go. Um, you mentioned that the the draw there are drawbacks of course to uh building an audience on the internet you it, that you can sometimes get kind of captured by the interests and the biases of your audience no doubt but i you know the way that i think about that since you, since you seem to kind of ask me about it is that i think it goes back to what you were saying about engineering the social environment uh, and doing that thoughtfully so no matter how you produce work there's always going to be some you know, form of, of political, political bias or social bias. There's, there's always going to be something tugging you in different directions that uh, are to some degree orthogonal to the pure radical truth that you're seeking. To me, it's really a matter of, it says not really um, a super sophisticated problem, really. It's ultimately a matter of choosing the particular pressures and, 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 and kind of, uh, compromises that are 
frankly, just most palatable to your personality really is the way that I think about it. So once you bite the bullet that there's always going to be some form of, of bias, even if you have, you know, the benefit of having one generous patron, right. Who is willing to, and this, you know, you've seen this throughout history and you, some people are lucky enough even to have it today where, you know, someone just, uh, with a lot of money takes a liking to you and just puts you on a kind of unlimited grant for, for a long time. Even that, you know, is not as that has problems as well. Right. Because you, you become, you know, so, so, uh, I don't even need to go into it. You know, you can become like worried about offending your patron or you feel obligated to perform a certain, uh, you know, social image that your patron would be happy with, whatever. Um, you name it, no matter how pure and perfect it seems as a funding mechanism, there's always going to be weird little little biases. So I think once you, bite the, once you bite the bullet of that, then you really just think in term, in personal terms, this is what I generally tell people because I get a lot of emails, people asking me this type of stuff. Like, how do you think this stuff through? And we talk a lot about it in the community. Um, my take is always that it's not actually this big, profound, you know, philosophical problem or, or serious political problem. It's literally choose the system that you feel most complements your strength, your personal strengths and your personal preferences in terms of the part of you that you most want to accentuate, the part of you that you most want to keep pure and that you want to express to its maximum. Choose a system that gives you the greatest freedom and latitude on that part of you that you feel is most important to, to keep free. And then make your little compromises on that part of you that is not that precious to you, that doesn't matter that much. And so that's ultimately a personal a personal decision that comes down to knowing yourself and knowing your strengths and weaknesses. So in, for my case, for instance, you know, I... I chose, for instance, not to do a monetized newsletter. You know, the the, the Substack model of of you know, you send out some posts for free and you send out some to paid subscribers. I don't like that because I'm very personally. I like the idea of building a large audience. I like the idea of of making my content free and public. And I would personally not enjoy the the conflict of you know when I write a good post that I want to share with my audience. Um, you know, having to decide does that go to the public or does that go behind you know the paywall? I just that doesn't sit. I just don't enjoy that. That that gives me stress and anxiety, and and I would rather not have that question to answer. But that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with that system it, for certain types of work for certain types of personalities. That makes perfect sense, right? Um, and so. I also am attracted to the idea of building a large audience through publishing a lot over time. I like that um, writing a newsletter and doing a podcast for the public. I like it because it all goes back to what you're saying about engineering the social environment that you want to pull out the best work in your own perspective for you know the way you see your own goals. I like the idea of being on this long-term track of like having to write a lot, having to publish a lot, having to do these things a lot because for me to succeed in what I'm doing practically, it means I have to be reading a ton. I have to be writing a ton. I have to be thinking and speaking with smart people as much as possible. So, so yeah, it's a lot of work and it takes a long time to build an audience in that way. It's, it's really hard work, but it's the hard work I want to be doing. And that's what's most important. You know, so to me, this is a very personal thing. And I, so I find it interesting what you're doing because it's not really a well-known model or I don't know of many people doing um, engineering it, engineering it in the way that you have. Um, but you know, I, I have a tremendous respect for for David uh, when it comes to content. I think I think he's extremely smart and shrewd um, when it comes to to content. And so um, that makes me really think twice and and really kind of wonder about this model. Maybe there's something to what you're doing that people are sleeping on. Um, so that, so it's interesting to have this discussion. Yeah, and, and a few just practical clarifications. Uh, the first one is. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend uh, anyone to, if they wanted to pursue a serious uh, uh, an academic life to also be building a startup. Just to be clear, like I had all of this material ready to go in, back in college. Um, and, and all I did in the last year, because I've just been working 24 seven on the company, was the, what, what was the filming of it. Now I have a few more essays left and I actually have like six or seven more lectures prepared but didn't film. So there, you might see some more content coming out of me. But it's not. I'm not like producing this ex nihilo while building the startup. So I, I, I just want to, to make sure people don't, uh, you know, don't, don't go down that rabbit hole. Um, the second thing I'll say is you're totally right about the there's a video medium and putting a lot of effort um, into this. Um, but the one thing I do want to highlight is I think there's a lot of limitations to the lecture format. Um, what I found working out really well in the lecture format is giving a lot of examples. Um, historical examples, you know, giving give a brief conceptual outline of the thing that you're trying to explain, but then, you know, overloading with multiple personal, historical, contemporary, you know, uh, you know uh, cult, pop, pop, pop media examples. Um, and that is, I think, is good for like finishing touches 
on, on a work when you're trying to clarify something. But I, I think when you want to really be trying to understand something, the sort of the written format is still much more rig rigorous uh, because, because you, you, you stay much more heavily on that conceptual analytical uh, side. So, you know, if people are interested and, and they, they, they go read my manuscript, you're going to find that much more dry and boring, um, but I think much more technical uh, and, and sort of sophisticated than what, what you see in the lectures. Um, and, and furthermore, the lectures would not have been possible without that sort of those groundwork done on that writing sphere. So for me, if you had a gun to my head of how I would pursue academic life outside of the academy, which I'm not going to do fully because, I, again, sometime in the future, I do want to do the PhD, um, I would probably write for a scholarly audience and then I would lecture to a, uh, not like public, public audience, but like a, a, a somewhat public audience. So that, 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 that would be my sort of barbell strategy of how to how to build that social environment. I mean, I definitely appreciate your interest to to do a PhD and put yourself through that that crucible because I, I agree with you. I think it's very worthwhile. I think just for the for the social benefit for the social kind of encouragement and inspiration that you were alluding to before, putting yourself in the environment of people working on long form, long term, original academic research, I think it's highly, highly valuable and effective to to go through that type of uh, serious multi-year experience and challenge. So, you know, when people ask me, should I do a PhD or whatever, you know, I, I always definitely um, grant that and allude to that. It's, it's you know, it's an amazing, it can be an ex amazing experience and a very, very worthwhile use of your time and energy for a certain type of person. So I'm all, I'm all aboard on that. I think the thing that is an interesting discussion or, or question that arises is after you do that, you know, I take your point that writing for a scholarly audience, uh, there's a lot of benefits to that as well. It keeps you very sharp. You have to um, aim for a certain degree of of serious professionalism and and a certain kind of sophistication that that is definitely beneficial in, in pulling you up to to a high level of of standards and rigor. I think the the issue that is interesting that a lot of people will face and it is kind of an interesting discussion is that um, there are some real questions in my mind around where contemporary academic writing is even going at all. So one of the things I faced as a, as a professor in, in playing that game was it became it became a real life question in my mind of like when I'm writing these, you know, 8,000 word articles with a million citations in this very, very uh, sophisticated, rigorous kind of academic style, you know, when you look at actually how intellectual power is being redistributed right now and how just the nature of, of influence and the nature of, of kind of media culture right now, both high media, you know, high media and low media, when you look at it honestly, it became for me quite hard to, un to explain to myself and really authentically understand why I was writing in this way, in this language, in uh, for these kind of like scholarly audiences because i'm sure you know the the statistics as, as well as as well as anyone does you know the 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 typical academic article gets literally zero citations uh so the there's this insanely kind of sad long tail of academic research where you know it's like most things power laws you know academic citations are are distributed in that way um and so you know, even and but this is even for very good scholars, like relatively very good scholars. Just the av you know, the average article by a very good scholar um, is just doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't really get read by that many people. Um, and really, even if it is read and cited by some people, it doesn't seem to have any effect on the world or how people think. And I think if what you're really interested in, as I think all great intellectuals ultimately are, is it, it's the interest in long-term shaping the culture. You know, we want to change the way that people think. We want to be remembered. We want to, um, you know, influence the actual trajectory of our civilization's thinking and 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 acting and, and being, right? And so if that is ultimate, the ultimate goal of any, ser of any serious thinking, writing, productive person, then I don't know. I think there there is that we are at this very interesting moment in time where um, it's just not at all clear anymore that academic publishing is the mo the highest probability way of of achieving that kind of stature. Um, so it's I don't know how you think about that. I think it's an interesting discussion. Let me let me address the easier part first. Like why lecture to a public audience? Um, and that to me is very easy. You don't have to. Compromise, like I gave these lectures with, yeah, we, we and just very quickly, um, I prepared these lectures for 
the type of lectures I was re receiving as an intermediate to an advanced undergraduate at Columbia. These weren't like graduate seminars, but that's what I modeled them under. So, so that's the type of sophistication you're giving as a lecture in the academy anyways. But you'd rather just make it public because I think the public is actually really interested uh, in this. So, so that's what, why I lecture to a public audience. Now, in terms of writing, um, may, maybe I'm not clear here. Like, um, I, when I say I want to write to a scholarly audience, I, I don't think I'm just trying to say uh, you know I want to publish it with Oxford University Press. Um, but but it's more like I doubt a public audience would be interested to go through. The, 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 the work of wh whatever I'm, I'm going to write. Um, again, I think uh, the manuscript, the unfinished manuscript that I'm working on is, is a great example. I dedicate that book to two or three of my best friends and even they haven't read it <laughs> because it's just so, it's just so dense and abstract and, and, and frankly, very dry and uh, uninteresting. Um, but I also think that to get to perhaps deep truths you, you need to, to have that type of in, engagement with, with ideas. Um, and if you, you know, if you look back in, in, in history, those do seem to be the books that last. Um, so I guess more what I'm trying to say is that is the type of writing style that, that, that I want to do. Very systematic, very, very analytical. Um, and also the type of writing style that helps me clarify my thinking the most. And, and I just simply doubt that a public audience would be interested in that. I mean, one thing I one thing I would add to that that I think is is interesting and maybe somewhat provocative that not a lot of people really agree with yet or believe yet that I think I do is that I think you would be surprised how many people out there in the public would actually be willing and read and able and interested in reading that kind of dense, sophisticated, academic level writing. Um, and this is one of my this is one of my ideas, or one of one of the things I'm perhaps more bullish on than 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 a lot of other people. There is this perception, which is totally fair enough, that if you want to write, you know, a 300 page manuscript that's very sophisticated, somewhat dry, just super rigorous, um, that you know, there's really uh, there's really not a public audience for that. And if you want to do that, you kind of have to go with Oxford University Press or something like that because that's kind of the only currently existing structure that. Um, makes logical and and uh, practical sense out of uh, producing that kind of work. Um, I think that's changing. I really do think that's changing. And I think we are fast approaching um, the threshold at which you could write an Oxford University level press uh, a book, a, a book at the level of that kind of press, um, at that level of rigor and sophistication, and you could self-publish it. And it would be read by a lot of very smart people, many of whom do have PhDs, many of whom already have their foot in the door of academia or whatever. So I think this is something I'm very bullish on, I'm very interested in, um, and I think you're going to see this over the next 10 or 20 years. I think you're going to see people doing um, you know, Oxford, Oxford Press level work and self-publishing it to a large but sophisticated public audience. Yeah. And this, that's, that's fascinating. Why do you think that is? My, the immediate thing that, that's jumping in my mind is because the, acad the academy seems to be crumbling in, in some way. That, that, that um, people sort of have lost belief that, that the academy is, is where they should go to, to, to inquire uh, about these things. And it's also crumbling financially, as, as, as we all know, other than this, the very cream of the crop sort of schools. Um, and, and, but, but yeah, I'm curious why that is because the, why you think that is because the, the larger cultural trend seems to point to the opposite direction, right? Like more TikTok, like more immediate gratification. Why, why do you think that there will be a spike? In One reason is because I think there's just a natural gradient to technology adoption where the first things that prove a concept are usually su silly and stupid and low status, right? It's like, you know, um, it's things like cartoons and games and porn kind of like break the the mold right. of something uh, because there's just a, a massive audience, a, an unsophisticated and massive audience that is willing to pay for those types of things. So those type those things tend to smash the mold and break through. And then sophisticated people look at it skeptically. They're like, oh, that's lame. That's just for stupid people. That's low status. And rightfully so, because in the early days it is. And then the technology proves itself, the, the, the patterns and the norms become 
naturalize, they extend into more and more parts of the society. And then at a certain point, the, the, the economic system is, is, is kind of proven. The, the economics of publishing through that way is proven by these low status uh, Trojan horses, if you will. And then at a certain point, the high status people, once it, it becomes normalized and like most normal people now do those things, then the high status people who were looking askance at it, now what they see is, okay, this is not stigmatized anymore. It's not just totally low status losers. It's like most people do it. It's considered totally normal. And the economic logic is demonstrated. So they see that it's plausible and even, you know, um, you know, fairly uh, reliable. It's, it's, it's consistent. Um, if for people who want to use those methods, uh, they can have, you know, predictable, reliable, positive uh, economic, um, you know, uh, consequences, right? You, you, you can get the paid for these things in a reliably, um, you know, attractive way. And then once that's in place, then you just see the high, you see the, um, the more prestigious institutions start to get, um, you know, kind of energy and, and talent and, um, effort is sucked out of these bureaucratic prestige institutions for people who see that, oh, okay, now it's time to actually do the more sophisticated stuff for the larger, for, for, um, more sophisticated audiences using those methods. Um, and so I think that's where we're at now, basically. And I think you see it in, you know, examples are like New York times journalists quitting the New York times to do a sub stack, you know, for a while doing an email newsletter was like a totally loser, low status thing. It was seen as like, oh, marketing people do that. Or you only do that if you're like shilling some snake oil or whatever. And now, you know, the reason that Substack was able to become a prestigious, interesting, um, high status thing is precisely for the, for the background model that I just sketched out the background, the background dynamics took place as I just described them. And then it was possible for Substack to kind of puncture, uh, the, the, the monopoly of sophisticated journalism that something like the New York times holds that was punctured by Substack. And I think you're going to see similar puncturings of academia. And I think you already are, I, you see them with, I mean, my whole, my whole little small business and my media operation, um, is, is one, uh, you know, clear and demonstrated successful example of, of that kind of puncturing. But I think what I'm doing is still very new. Like not a lot of people know that what I'm doing, there is a reproducible playbook for what I'm doing. You can build an audience. You can do your own online courses that basically everything that professors do right now inside of the, the monopoly prestige system, um, can in fact be done independently online. People just, there's an information gap. People literally don't know that they can do it yet. They don't know how exactly they can do it, but like, I'm just one example of it's proof that you can do it. And so that's my mental model. I, and I, I just, because I'm seeing it because I'm doing it myself, I'm just like very bullish on, I just have a high confidence that it's, it's going to kind of cause a deluge, um, because it's just so much better. It's so much, uh, you know, superior, all things considered. Yeah. So Jonathan, I just want to thank you for coming out. I, I'm going to put links in the show notes. So everyone should go check out your lecture on Gerard, which is on YouTube. It's amazingly well produced. Um, there's almost no video content out there in the world right now from an independent scholar such as yourself. That's so finely and amazingly well produced. It, it's really something else what, what you and David made. So that's out now. Uh, people should go check it out. Like I said, I'll put links in the show notes. And yeah, this is a fascinating conversation. I want to thank you for, for coming on and, you you know, sharing, sharing your thoughts on Gerard and, you know, having this very interesting discussion about, you know, the practicalities of independent scholarship today and, and the near future of all of this. So thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Justin. I really enjoyed this. Thanks.